good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us from. Um, I'm really delighted you're here for the book launch of Ezekiel Hefe's fantastic new book. It's, I have a copy right here. Oh, no, too zoomed, sorry. Um, but his book is called Detention by Non-State Armed Groups Under International Law. I've had the pleasure of reading through Ezekiel's book and I'm really thrilled to be moderating this conversation. Um, as Wes mentioned, this event is organized by the ASIL Liba Society on the Law of Armed Conflict. Uh, both Ezekiel and I are on the executive committee of that um, interest group this year. And I want to thank all of our executive committee members and also the ASIL staff for helping to facilitate this event. My name is Jess Peake, and I'm the director of the International and Comparative Law Program at UCLA School of Law, and also the assistant director of the Promise Institute for Human Rights. At UCLA Law, I often teach a class on the laws of war and the war on terror, and I'm really excited to have this book as a resource for my future students. Um, just to give you a little bit of the structure, we're going to have some initial opening remarks by Ezekiel, the author of the book. Then we're going to have uh, some opening remarks from Nathalie Wiseman, followed by a response from Ezekiel, then we'll have some more remarks from Catherine Fortin, another response from Ezekiel, and then we'll get to the Q&A. So please do start putting your questions into the Q&A box, and we'll get to as many of those as we can when we get to the right time. So Ezekiel Hefez is the Senior Policy and Legal Advisor at Geneva Call, which is a humanitarian NGO that promotes respect of humanitarian norms by armed actors. Ezekiel holds a PhD from the University of Leiden, an LLM in IHL and Human Rights from the Geneva Academy, and a law degree from the University of Buenos Aires School of Law. Prior to joining Geneva Call, he worked as a field and protection delegate and as a head of office for the ICRC in Colombia, Afghanistan, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. So I'm going to leave your introduction there, Ezekiel, and turn things over to you for some opening remarks. Uh, thank you very much, Jess. And uh, first of all, I have to say that um, everything I'm going to be saying today is in my personal capacity, so in no way it links uh, Geneva Call or any other institution. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you, uh, Jess, for moderating the event, but also Catherine and Natalie for commenting on, on, on the book, and to the American Society of International Law and to the Liber Society on the Law of Armed Conflict, to Shiri Krebs as well, who's the chair um, of the Liber Society for putting this together. Um, so perhaps uh, uh, what I want to start with is on the reason why actually I, I started working on this on this specific topic on detention by non-state armed groups. I mean, for a number of years, I've been working on the issue of armed groups and international law and non-state actors and how international law deals with non-state actors. But um, when the Serdar Mohammed uh, decision came out in 2014, uh, so this decision that it, it was in the in the United Kingdom, uh, domestic court saying that um, states didn't have any, um, I would say, legal authorization to deprive individuals of the liberty under international humanitarian law in non-international conflict. I was actually um, challenged. Uh, I was working in the field at the time, and I my re my first reaction was actually to think about whether what what I, what actually I would respond to an armed group commander if uh, he or she would ask me whether they had uh, a legal authorization to deprive individuals of the liberty under international humanitarian law. And at the time, when I was going through, through the decision in, 20, in May 2014, my reaction was to think like, obviously international humanitarian law uh, should be the answer. And at the time, actually, I, I argued um, strongly um, in favor of international humanitarian law as, as a legal basis, basis to, to detain in a, a non-international conflict for states and, and non-state armed groups. Since then, however, my, my reflections of the topic have uh, moved from that perspective. Um, and this is based on different, different experiences and, and reflections uh, since 2014 until now. I mean, of course, Serdar Mohammed, the first decision came out in, 20, in 2014. Then there was uh, two, two additional, two further decisions in 2015 and 2017. But the, the conclusion was that international humanitarian law would not provide a legal basis to detain um, for, for the parties to conflict. In addition, in parallel to those domestic law decisions, um, armed groups were depriving individuals of the liberty all around the world. I mean, the ICRC estimated recently that there were about 80 armed, armed groups detaining um, in the in context where they, the ICRC uh, is active and, and works actually. Um, and we have uh, reports by international organizations, by the UN, by Human Rights Watch, by Amnesty International, 
uh, by local civil society organizations, uh, by international tribunals now speaking about armed groups depriving individuals of their liberty. So not only the, the, the domestic courts dealing with this, but also the international uh, bodies and international institutions dealing with armed groups detaining. And then there were other developments such as um, in, in, in the ICRC uh, with the commentaries that came out in 2016, but also uh, with the Red Cross and Red Crescent um, meeting that took place in 2015 in which the issue of the detention in armed conflict uh, was discussed. So when, when you put all these things together, uh, my this was kind of the these issues were the driver for me to to start focusing not jo, not so much on non-state armed groups and international uh, law, but also on actually how international deals with certain specific behaviors or activities of non-state armed groups that are unlawful entities under domestic law uh, are are dealt with by 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 this legal regime. And the focus of this book and the focus of my PhD uh, in the University of Leiden um, was on the issue of detention. So just this is kind of the, the basic or the basis of how or why actually I dealt with this issue in the, in the first place. Um, the question of what would I respond uh, if an armed group commander would ask me whether they had a legal authorization to detain or what would be the legal basis for them to deprive individuals of the liberty was actually, I would say, the, 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 the first driver for this thesis and this book to, to see the light. And Having having that in mind, it is actually a very practice oriented work. Uh, so, it, I mean, if you it, it just to, to give you a hint on how it is structured, it contains an introduction and then it, it has a first chapter in which um, the legal personality of non state armed groups is dealt with, but also it has a, a, it presents an, an advocates for to assess non state armed groups um, behaviors in light of a certain typology. And this is, is actually, it, it tries to bridge the gap between a legal analysis and other social sciences uh, perspectives uh, in which typologies are um, mostly dealt with and analyzed. And, and the typology that I present that it has three types of groups, uh, de facto authorities, armed opposition groups or armed opposition movements and uh, militias um, tries to be as, as representatives of the armed groups that exist nowadays as, as possible. And the idea of presenting this typology, and I'm going to be dealing with this uh, later on, is to try to understand how armed groups operate in the in the real world, um, whether a set of expectations can be developed in regards to their detention activities, and whether this typology of these three types of groups can be a reflective of what actually happens in in modern conflicts. And based on that, I, I moved uh, on to see how international humanitarian law and international human rights law deal with non-state armed groups, uh, taking into account these this typologies, these three types of groups. And, and then this is dealt with in chapter two uh, that contains uh, an analysis on the reasons why armed groups are uh, potentially, well, they, they are uh, without a question bound by international humanitarian law, but could potentially be bound by international human rights law. And then the reasons of why it is important to deal with uh, both legal regimes when dealing with, when assessing non-state armed groups detention activities. This is chapter two and then chapter three uh, is specifically focused on how um, detention in non-international non conflict has been uh, examined uh, specifically with the Sardar Mohammed uh, decisions, but also on whether you know this, if, if actually there is no legal basis to enter in armed conflict in non-international conflict, and how this relates to the prohibition of arbitrary deprivation of liberty that exists in international humanitarian law, and potentially, I mean, it also exists in international human rights law, and it's potentially bound upon armed groups. Uh, so, how these prohibitions interact with a potential lack of international of lack of authorization to deprive individuals of the liberty in, in, in international law for non-state armed groups. I mean, for states, states rely on their domestic law when they form it in a territorial non-international conflict against an armed group. So what would be the, the possibility for non-state armed groups to be respectful of this prohibition of arbitrary deprivation of liberty and at the same time uh, have a legal basis uh, and, and have uh, grounds to deprive of individuals of the liberty? So this is a discussion in chapter three which also uh, proposes to examine non-state armed groups uh, through the lens of a legal pluralistic perspective in which we can examine uh, also non-state armed groups uh, laws and, and, and normative um, 
developments, you know, whether non-state armed groups uh, own laws and codes and legislations um, could provide a legal basis for these non-state entities to, de to detain in non-international conflict. And the, the, the practice driven of, of this book can be also observed in chapter four, um, which contains uh, three case studies that follow this typology that I propose in chapter two, that are um, those of uh, the Autonomous Administration of Northeast Syria, the FARC uh, in, in Colombia, and finally, uh, my, my militia, the APCLS in, in the DRC that contain interviews directly uh, with uh, members of, of those movements and, and other key stakeholders to see how actually they deprive individuals of their liberty. And one of the conclusions that the book finds is that these movements actually, they, they do not rely on international law as a legal basis to detain in a conflict, they rely on their own uh, sources. And they actually consider that they need to enact certain uh, certain norms um, to, to justify their their activities in non-international conflict, which I thought it was it was interesting, especially because legal discussions have been around whether international law provides a legal basis to detain. And you can see when talking to these armed actors that they rely on their own uh, norms and codes and not so much of international law. And the book concludes um, by proposing, based on the practice of armed groups, certain uh, principles that international humanitarian organizations can use uh, when engaging with armed groups on issues related to detention, but also non-state armed groups can, can also rely on um, if they want to actually uh, move forward in respecting international standards when conducting detention activities. And I'm gonna stop there because um yeah i look forward to to hearing catherine's and natalie's uh, points of view on the, on the book thank you <clears throat> thank you very much ezekiel for uh providing that background to you know the, the origins of this inquiry and subsequent book um we're going to turn to natalie wiseman uh natalie is the senior legal officer with the un office for the coordination of humanitarian affairs and her work there focuses on international humanitarian law as it relates to the protection of civilians and humanitarian activities before joining the UN, she was Senior Director of the Counterterrorism and Human Rights Project at Columbia Law School's Human Rights Institute. And she's also worked at the International Committee of the Red Cross, various human rights NGOs, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, and in private legal practice. So, um, Natalie, I would like to invite you to give some remarks on Ezekiel's work. Thank you so much, Jess. Thank you all um, for uh, including me in this excellent launch, uh, Ezekiel. I've found your book to be incredibly clear and intuitive and a real, real pleasure to read. Um, uh, and I, as you've just said, it's a very practice oriented approach that you've taken. And I think that it was that that spoke to me most as a IHL and at times IHRL practitioner. Um, so I can definitely um, say that it's it's very much grounded in reality, in practice, and um, and it's the, that pragmatic approach that I think uh, can speak to many practitioners of, of IHL and IHRL. And um, I also wanted to mention that um, many of the questions that you raise before you even get into the case studies um, really are pertinent to so many other issues of IHL and IHRL. And um, in the work that I do, which is not so focused on detention, um, it was those preliminary questions that you address in your sort of initial chapters that resonated in particular and that I thought I might share some, some thoughts on. Um, without at all meaning to divert from the detention focus of the book, I thought I might just focus on some of the preliminary questions that spoke to me. And the, the first was your very honest um, sort of dissection of the basis on which armed groups are bound by IHL and human rights. Um, it's something that we tend to skip over. Um, not really question, uh, take for granted, um, need to assert, of course, but I thought it was very uh, helpful that you, and ought, sort of intellectually honest as well, that you were able to dissect the basis for which, uh, on which I, um, armed groups are bound by a child and human rights, um, the range of theories, even though that wasn't the point of, of, of 
these chapters, you still addressed a number of the range of theories um, and you know, pointed out that not all are unanimously um, accepted or established. Um, and I thought it was also interesting, as you've just pointed out, that um, when it came to the authority to detain, you've just said that it's based on internal norms that um, groups consider that they have an authority to detain. And so the question that I had for you is to what extent the basis for being bound by IHL and human rights ever really arises uh, or has arisen in your, in your practice, um, either from groups or other actors that may have either accepted or called it into question. I'm curious about that. Um, and then equally grounded very much in reality and in a manner that resonated deeply with my end of, of practice was your typology of groups, um, which I thought was extremely helpful and absolutely corresponded to um, what we see in practice um, and how, um, how the typology necessarily connects to the, uh, as you've described, a sliding scale of obligations. And, um, and how IHL actually allows for this already, for example, in additional protocol one, which applies to a different type of armed group than say common article three more broadly. Um, and it also reminded me of the sort of sliding scale approach um, to the invasion phase of a state uh, invading an another country and applying protections under the law of occupation independently of whether there is actual occupation. And so it's um, just, it reminded me of that. And it was also very um, sort of, again, grounded in, in reality and what is realistic and what is pragmatic. And I appreciated that in particular. And the same for uh, human rights law. And this is also an area that I um, often have to deal with in practice, uh, either because there is no uh, IHL rule that applies to the problem I'm dealing with, or because there is, as you've pointed out in your book, no nexus with armed conflict in the sort of humanitarian concerns that I'm dealing with. And so here too, I was curious to hear more about that, that sliding scale of obligations under both IHL and human rights law in relation to detention or perhaps uh, beyond, but certainly in relation to detention. I know that you've mentioned in the past, um, fair trials, for example, but I'm sure that there are others. And so again, just to conclude, um, there really are implications to many of the aspects of your book that go well beyond detention and that I think would be extremely helpful to all practitioners, um, including in connection with just sort of type of engagement um, with armed groups that humanitarians might have um, and how they need to um, before you get into the substance, even just adapt their engagement to the type of armed groups. And then of course, adapt the substance of that engagement based on, on the typology and the grounds on which um, they may or may not be bound by certain IHL rules. So I wanted to conclude on, on that just to say how pragmatic it was. And I'm eager to hear your reactions to some of the things I've mentioned. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Natalie. Ezekiel, I'd love to give you the opportunity to respond to some of Natalie's comments. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you for these this questions. Um, so very, very interesting ones, of course. I, I gave a bit of a space for those discussions because in my mind, um, so non-state armed groups are non-state actors in nature. So they're, they're entities that uh, the way in which, and, and they're in, in addition to being non-state actors, a specific category of non-state actors, they're unlawful entities under domestic law. Uh, they're prosecuted for taking up arms. I mean, for constituting actually a non-state armed group, they can be prosecuted under, under the law of the state. So for me, it was quite important if I had to deal with non-state armed groups and the specific activities of detention that I dealt with how international law deals with non-state armed groups and specifically how international humanitarian law deals with non-state armed groups, but also international human rights law deals with non-state armed groups because there might be situations in which international human rights law um, I think uh, provides a uh, certain uh, legal framework for non-state armed groups' behaviors and activities in the field of detention, but also uh, beyond. So I, I thought like addressing in chapter two, uh, 
Um, first of all, why it is important to deal with both legal frameworks and non-state armed groups in the field of detention, it was essential. And then on the reason why they are bound by these two legal regimes, but this is mostly understand that this might be a theoretical perspective and some individuals may see this as, as a theoretical analysis. But I think it is important because I've been in different discussions with non-state armed groups, but also with uh, other key stakeholders. And there is always a question of, well, you know, it's like, People questioning the, the legal binding or the, the binding nature of human rights law upon non-state armed groups, saying that, of course, the majority of human rights law treaties uh, they address the, the the behavior of states and and not uh, of non-state armed groups. I mean, with two exceptions, the Kampala Convention and also the optional protocol on the rights of the child. And there might be other interpretations that have been provided in in the international jurisprudence or by scholar in terms of the uh, Convention on on the prohibition of enforced disappearances, but and also the Convention Against Torture. But I mean, I, I thought like I, I had to deal with both legal regimes when dealing with non-state armed groups and detention. Um, of course, it is undisputed that international humanitarian law binds non-state armed groups. Uh, there is no discussion about this, although certain groups, they might say that international humanitarian law is an imposition of the of Western states. And that, again, we might think that that's a, a discourse that was provided by non-state armed groups in the 60s and 70s by guerrilla movements, but um, it's still out there. Certain groups still believe that it's a Western imposition, and they might say this when dealing with uh, humanitarian organizations presenting and, and advancing on IHL. So this is something that is still out there. With human rights law, um, I would say that it is interesting because the, the, the controversy um, comes uh, also from uh, lawyers and institutions that are not so much uh, willing to, to, to open the possibility of non-state armed groups being bound by human rights law. Um, again, I, as I put in, the, in, in, in chapter two, there are certain institutions that have changed their positions with, with respect to this. I mean, the ICRC is one of them, but also we have seen in the last few years an increasing number of resolutions by the UN Security Council and, and human rights bodies in Geneva speaking about human rights and um, non-state armed groups. Uh, so there is kind of a shift towards that, um, in, in specifically in the binding nature of, of both legal regimes. Um, on whether, what's the, the logic between the typology? And I, I thought, you know, it's interesting because when when you, you, you see the discussions that took place at the ICRC, the ICRC conducted uh, some consultations on the issue of detention with states before coming up with their own position in 2014. And one of the points that states um, highlighted was that there was kind of, armed groups had a very different and diverse structure and logic. And it was very difficult to develop a set of expectations on how our armed groups would behave in the, in the, in the, in the field of detention. So this is interesting because this is mostly assessed from a legal perspective. But when you see from political sciences, sociology, anthropology, you see that the discussion of typologies and the discussion how on, on developing this sort of this type of set of expectations happen much more often. So when you bring those worlds, the legal world and the other social sciences world, you see that there is a connection that I believe it is uh, often uh, missing in legal analysis. And Again, this, this book and my PhD, I have to say that has greatly benefited from other scholarly production that has produced in the legal realm before, such as Catherine's book is one of them. Uh, she, she also dealt with the issue of um, governance and, and you know, the application of human rights law to armed groups. So I, I strongly recommend her book, by the way, in, in this field. Uh, I think, no, it, it, it is true. I mean, I know you're smiling, but I think it, it has greatly benefited from your, from your scholarly work. Um, and but the typology, I think it's kind of it's it has not been it had not been included in other legal um, work. I mean, it had been dealt with from a, a different perspectives also in Tillman Rodenhauser book, but um, not to develop some sort of a set of expectations, but to identify the relation between the law and and, and its addressees. Um, and the last point that you you highlighted was the sliding scale of application, which of course, as you say, it is in in IHL clearly identified in the relation between Common Article 3 and Additional Protocol 2 and armed groups, not so much in, in customary international law in the rules identified by the ICRC. Um, in human rights law, this has also uh, been presented and proposed by other uh, scholars and institutions 
um, not through the lens of this typology of, you know, de facto authorities, armed opposition movements and militias, but uh, in light of the organization. And I, I, I again, the book um, moves and takes some of these elements, uh, but specifically focusing on detention and on the detention um, activities of non-state and groups. So there is a prohibition of arbitrary deprivation of liberty um, that, it's in international humanitarian law, but it's also in human rights law. So in certain situations, that prohibition of international human rights law should be brought into the discussion when dealing especially with highly organized groups, um, but not, not to everyone. I think it's, it's, this is also the issue of nexus um, that I'm gonna be discussing later today. Um, I think it is, it is quite relevant to identify which behaviors are regulated by international humanitarian law, which are regulated by international human rights or which behaviors are regulated by both in line of what the ICJ said in, in the advisory in the, in the advisory opinion related to the wall. Um, so this was also one of the starting points in assessing the relation between armed groups and international human rights and international humanitarian law. Thank you very much for these questions and these points. Uh, thank you, Ezekiel. I'm going to turn things over to Catherine Fortin for another set of reflections on your book. Catherine is a senior lecturer of public international law and human rights at Utrecht University Netherlands Institute of Human Rights. And the focus of her research is the legal framework which applies to non-international armed conflicts, particularly looking at this intersection between international humanitarian law and human rights law. Um, Catherine is the founder and co-editor of the Armed Groups and International Law blog, and her prize-winning book, The Accountability of Armed Groups Under Human Rights Law, was published by Oxford University Press in August of 2017. So Catherine, I'd like to invite you to make some remarks. Thanks so much, Jess. Um, it's bedtime in my household and I have two children who I can hear running around downstairs, so I hope they don't run in, but just so you know. Um, well, it's really wonderful to be here to help celebrate the publication of Ezekiel's book. It really is a wonderful book, Ezekiel, so congratulations. Um, it's a piece of scholarship that I would say is not only excellent, but also one that was really sorely needed. Uh, because it deals with some of the most cutting edge questions in the field of non-international armed conflict um, and questions not only of law, but of practice and policy. And I think it does a really great job at answering both by means of first doctrinal research and second case studies. So really congratulations. Um, there's a there's a lot in the book that I agree with an awful lot, um, like, for example, you know, the position you take regarding the role of armed group practice and the formation of customary international law, um, the conclusions you draw on the value and need for domestic law of armed groups when fulfilling the prohibition of um, arbitrary detention um, and the nexus requirements. Um, so you've made my life quite difficult tonight, <laughs> um, but I, I, in, in the spirit of trying to open the discussion also for the people who are attending, I'm going to ask you some questions or I'm going to talk about some questions that arise in my head when reading your book that I think emerge from your work and that I'd really love to hear your thoughts on. So the first relates to the nexus requirement, which I think is, which Natalie's of course already mentioned, um, and is a really important issue, I think, and one that we see coming up increasingly frequently, as uh, I think you already mentioned, it was dealt with by the ICRC in its most recent challenges report. Um, it came up also in the Al Mahdi case relating to the def definition of attack. Um, and it's coming up again now we see in the Al Hassan case in front of the International Criminal Court. So the issue, of course, relating to the nexus a test is um, we're using it as a tool or it's often being used as a tool to help define the proper conceptual scope of international humanitarian law and then very often vis-a-vis -vis international human rights law. And as a test then it seems to be particularly important when looking at issues that are dealt with under both international humanitarian law and international human rights law. So for example, detention or issues relating to the right to life broadly conceived. And what struck me when reading your book is that 
scholarship 10 years ago, 10 plus years ago, looking at um, these similar issues relating to the relationship then between IHL and human rights law and their intersectional interoperability on issues such as detention or targetability, was very often having recourse to the Lex Specialis test in all of its imperfections. And a lot of the scholarship then was indeed exploring some of those imperfections and difficulties of this Lex Specialis test. And as time's gone by, there seems to be a growing consensus that maybe we shouldn't be using the Lex Specialis test, we should be using the principle of systemic integration found in the Vienna Convention of the Law of Treaties. So what struck me when reading your book is this literature on the relationship between IHL and human rights law, employing these tools, Lex Specialis, moving into the Vienna Convention, seems to have very little contact with the literature employing the Nexus test. And, and I was interested in that. And it made me think, and I would love to hear your thoughts, Ezekiel, on you know, why that is and what how do you see the difference between these two tests? So are they different tools? How do they differ? What is their different function, if any? And do you see their function to be different? Or do you see their function to actually be the same or somehow connected? Should we be seeing these literature streams coming together? So that's my first question. Um, secondly, and connectedly related to the Nexus test, of course, we both know that it's emerged out of jurisprudence relating to jurisdiction. So it's, relate, it's emerged out of a sort of post facto determination on whether IHL applies to a certain situation. But it could also be a pl a pl a, um, being applied sort of front up, you know, before before an act's taken place, before an act of detention has taken place to help parties to an armed conflict determine what norms should be applied and, you know, what the consequence of particular violations of those norms may bring. So in which case it would have to, if it was used in that way, it would have to be kind of operationalised. And I'm curious to hear whether you've given any thought to that as to whether it does indeed need to be somehow operationalised and how it would be. Um, the, the next point I would like to mention is your is your dealing with the issue of armed groups own laws. Um, and here again, you know, I really agree with your very thorough and careful analysis of this issue. I, I have to admit, I've never been entirely sure what the word power means from a legal perspective. Um, you don't have to tell me now, but perhaps that's something for another day. Um, I want to say I really valued your recourse to combative pluralism. I thought it was a really helpful descriptor for what's very often going on in these territories. I also thought you provided some really helpful guidance on what armed groups need to, laws need to look like to satisfy the non-arbitrariness standard. And you talk about, you know, they need to be concise, they need to be um, uh, promulgated, etc. One thing I read less about in your book, but I'm sure you have an opinion on, is whether there's also a standard in the law for how armed group laws need to be passed. So the question bothering me is, when, do, when and how do we know whether an armed group rule is a law or not? Um, what is the difference between rules and laws? Um, is it, does the legal framework only ask us to look at the arbitrariness issue, whether something's duly precise, duly promulgated, or do we also need to look at how a rule has been passed? It strikes me that, um, you know, it might be that some leader of the armed group has just announced that this is the rule, but it might alternatively have been a rule that's emerged from a kind of pseudo legislature. We both know that armed groups often have them. So I'm curious to know from you, does it matter? Does the law say anything about that? And if so, what? And lastly, and I don't want to spend too much time because I want to hear and leave some space. There will be people on the call who are curious to know what you think about further points of study on the issue of either armed groups and detention or armed groups and governance or armed groups and international law. And I'm curious to know whether your study you think raised issues that need further examination or exploration. That would be great. But congratulations again, Ezekiel.
Uh, thank you very much, Catherine. Ezekiel, over to you. Thank you very much, um, Jess, and thank you, Catherine, for these points. It's, uh, it's, no, it's, it's great. It's a lot of food for thought. Um, I mean, on, on, the, on the next thing, I have to say, again, my, my reflections on this topic have uh, changed over the years. So um, a few years ago, and again, actually, I, I, I was reading your book. And uh, um, so at the time, of course, there, you advanced on the issue of, well, there are some issues um, that take place in the territories controlled by non-state armed groups that uh, do not necessarily have a nexus to the conflict. Um, so for me, that was actually the starting point. At the time, I, I wasn't convinced about this because I said, of, I mean, this is a bit tricky because armed groups are often created uh, to conduct war, you know, as like to actually undertake, to, to take up the, the, their arms against the state or another group or a foreign state uh, or the territorial one. Um, but when I, was, when I started thinking about this and I put together this typology, um, everything became a bit more clear. So my, my reflection right now is that um, when you think about the different degrees of organization that armed groups have and whether um, there might be situations that do not have a nexus to the conflict, um, I think for certain groups that are highly organized, it is and have established a certain territorial control for a number of years, have established institutions, ministries, they regulate the everyday lives of individuals through these different institutions. Um, it is, it is, I would say, clearer the, the scene in which uh, certain activities will not have a nexus to the conflict. So I, I happen to have visited certain uh, territories controlled by de facto authorities, as I put it in the book. And you see the lives of individuals living in those territories. And for them, it is quite similar as living under the control of the state. Um, so th there are issues that do not have a nexus, to, do not have a, a necessarily a relation to the conflict. And this is for the, those highly organized non-state armed groups or non-state actors with de facto control over a territory. Um, so it's a different situation is when you go into the villages controlled by a militia, um, a militia that has a very limited territorial control, has not established any um, civilian wing. Um, it has been created perhaps for uh, the defense of those communities against other communities. Uh, they were clearly created to conduct uh, warfare and their only goal is to actually, is, is, is for that, conflict to take place. So for those groups, I argue, it's much more difficult to see that those activities that are not regulated for to the conflict. So this is the first point that I want to clarify is that I, I conceive the nexus um, much more clear in those highly organized non-state armed groups. And this is where non-state uh, human rights law uh, kicks in. Um, with respect to the Lex Specialis and, and other rules of interpretation, for me, the difference is that when, when you read the discussions happening about non-state armed groups 10 years ago, 15 years ago, first of all, they wouldn't differentiate between different levels of organization of the group. So they would treat armed groups as a single type of entity that would be out there. And the relation, the vertical relation with the law would be kind of straightforward, whether they are bound by human rights law or they're not bound by human rights law but they would not differentiate these different types of, of organizations or, or degree of control. This is the first thing. The second thing is that Lex Specialis and other rules of interpretation, um, often they, they focus on how two rules uh, regulating the same activity would be dealt with. So if you have the right to life, for instance, and you have a prohibition to arbitrarily deprive uh, an individual of, of uh, the right to life, and then you have international humanitarian law, the rules of conduct of hostilities, how this would you know, deal with each other. Well, when you deal with a detention, this is a, a, a clash of norms that you wouldn't necessarily see because you would see that there is a prohibition of arbitrary deprivation of liberty in international humanitarian law, one in human rights law. So there is no contradiction there, no, no necessarily clash of norms. And then, International humanitarian law does not provide a legal basis to detain, and international human rights law would only speak about uh, the reference to a kind of law that needs to be uh, adopted 
for the arbitrary deprivation of liberty to be lawful. So there is not necessarily this clash of norms between human rights law and international humanitarian law. So what would need to be observed is this, we need to define the scope of applications of both legal regimes and theories where international humanitarian law would apply for those activities that are re- linked to the conflict and international human rights law would apply for those activities that are not linked to the conflict for those de facto authorities detention for criminal issues that are not necessarily linked to the conflict would find the prohibition of arbitrary deprivation of liberty in human rights law. This is different, as, as I said, for militias and for uh, most of, more often than not for armed opposition groups. Uh, the second point on how, and I'm going to go quickly now, is in terms of non-state armed groups, own laws, and uh, the operationalization, I would say, of, of these things, uh, these discussions. I think the key, and, and it's linked to the co- combative pluralism, I think it's, it's key that um, that we actually start engaging with non-state armed groups lawmaking dev- uh, processes. I mean, again, when this is this is a place of tension, I would say, and again, we have discussed it in the past, but this is a place of tension because, of course, uh, it's a place where you know you are challenging the the, the, the straight state prerogative of um, you know creating a, a, a legal framework that regulates the behavior of certain individuals. And you're accepted that non-state armed groups, again, that are unlawful entities under domestic law, they can develop these uh, legal frameworks um, to, as I argue, to actually respect their international law obligations. So if there is an international obligation saying that arbitrary deprivation of liberty are prohibited, then uh, you know, in order to actually be respectful of that obligation, that does not mean that all detention by non-state armed groups are prohibited. It means that only those with an arbitrary nature are prohibited. So it means that non-state armed groups would need to rely on certain legal basis or grounds to, to prevent that that arbitrariness happen. And that can only take place if they adopt their legal their own legal basis. Because states will not provide a legal basis, because UN Security Council resolutions will not provide a legal basis, and because there is no legal basis in international humanitarian law explicitly mentioned. So this is something that in order to operationalize this discussion, you need to engage in, in lawmaking uh, uh, debates with non-state armed groups. So combative pluralism is one way of seeing this. I mean, it's non-state armed groups adopt, adopting laws that are sometimes in contradiction with those of the territorial state. Uh, but we also see non-state armed groups adapting the laws of the territorial states according to their own customs, uh, their own language, even adapting laws of foreign states. Um, it, you know, it, it, and, and we see this. So it's not necessarily uh, combative pluralism is one way of seeing it, but of course there are other ways of pluralism that are more aligned to those of the territorial states or foreign states. I mean, we have groups that take control of the territory and they actually um, apply the laws that were adopted by the territorial states. So this is something that is out there and we have to acknowledge of, of those situations. And the last point um, on, uh, um, no, there are two more points on how non-state armed groups need to adopt those laws. So I, I include this in the in the book in terms of how the Inter-American uh, Court of Human Rights has said, has said that, you know, for a law to be considered as, as a law according to the American convention, it needs to be adopted by a democratically, um, you know, a democr- actually a democratic, yeah, democratic oriented a process, a legislative body. And of course, for an armed group, this is not gonna be the case, but legal pluralism solves this by assessing how the, that norm is perceived by other stakeholders, not just not just focus on the process, but also focus on how this law is, is perceived by those who the, the law addresses, by uh, whether the, the authority that adopts that law is considered as an authority by those who are addressees of that law, um, how is that system actually, that legal system, not just the process as such, but uh, the, the system as, as a whole. And it is interesting because when we see what states do, um, you know, it's like we have a, a, a kind of a legal pluralism in, in states uh, laws as well and, and states process as well. So I think, again, not because non-state armed groups have different ways of adopting laws that, you know, that should be addressed differently. Um, otherwise, what we will find is that non-state armed groups with a high level of organization and, and control, um, then they will be allowed to adopt laws, but those that are more limited in nature, they will not be allowed to adopt laws. So it's like then the people who are living in territories controlled by those 
that do not have that level of organization, those groups that do not have that level of organization will may have less protection than you know, those that live in territories controlled by highly organized groups. And the last one on points of study, I think, again, the last 10 or 15 years have seen an increasing number of studies on, on non-state armed groups and international law. I, for me, the, the, the key point here is the need to connect legal studies with other social sciences studies. So not just political sciences or sociology or anthropology, but studies related to psychology, for instance. Um, so I think this should be brought to the table because it is otherwise quite difficult to understand the dynamics between non-state armed groups and people living in the territories that control the legal dynamics on compliance without actually understanding those, those um, other social sciences. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ezekiel. And thank you, Natalie and Catherine. You've made my job very easy by providing such rich comments and questions for discussion. Um, Ezekiel, as we've heard, your book is this wonderful combination of doctrinal research and case studies. And I feel like we spent a lot of time sort of discussing more of the doctrinal side of the research. And so I wanted to give you the opportunity to talk a little bit about the case studies. So in your methodology section, you mention that the non-doctrinal part of the research took this two-pronged approach, first looking at sort of the, the laws and rules of the armed groups, and you've talked a little bit about that, but then also looking at the practice of three non-state armed groups in particular, um, the Autonomous Administrati Administration of North and East Syria, the FARC in Colombia, and the People's Alliance for Free and Sovereign Congo in the Eastern DRC. And I know those are all in uh, contexts in which you've worked personally. And um, so I was just wanted to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about how that practical experience informed this work. And there's a particular question in the Q&A from Brian Frankel that asks um, if you could just tell us a little bit about the groups that you interviewed and how your theory applies to those groups in particular. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your question, Jess, and for Brian's question as well. Um, so in, in, as regards to the first question in terms of how my experience informed the case studies, um, well, I mean, I, I had information about the three groups uh, before I conducted this. And when I was developing the typology, I mean, and, and I was thinking and reflecting about the case studies, um, one of the you know, this kind of a strong element when one develops a case study is uh, to know those um, case studies uh, wh wh while you're developing. So it's not something that is necessarily new. So uh, this was kind of one of the strong uh, reasons, uh, the strong, the, the, I would say, the strongest reason why I actually included these three case studies. I should have said anyways that there have been, um, the practice of other groups uh, is also included in a, uh, as, as a consideration for the development, for instance, of the principles that are included in the conclusion, but also for some of the conclusions of chapter four as to how or why armed groups deprive individuals of their liberty. So these three case studies were kind of like the, the umbrella, I would say, but other, other groups um, that could also be included in these three types of, in these categories uh, were also considered. Um, so my experience was also was quite important. I've been working on issues relating to non-state armed groups for a number of years already. I've been interacting with, with non-state armed groups on different humanitarian issues also for a number of years. So uh, this, this was one of the reasons why actually I, I decided to, to work on this as a PhD and also uh, the form of a book. Um, so this is obviously a, a, one of the, the, the important aspects of, of the, the bringing this other uh, social sciences perspective to, to the book and to the thesis. Um, and how the theories actually would apply to these case studies. Well, as I said, the case studies are reflective of the typology that is advanced in chapter two. And the book is actually, I mean, when, when, when you go through chapters two, three, uh, and four, um, you see how international law deals or may deal differently with the, the armed groups according to the level of organization. So of course, for instance, the type of law that you're gonna observe in a de facto authority are different to the type of law that are adopted by a my, my uh, group, uh, by a group that has a low level of organization, um, both in terms of the um, sophistication that that law will have, but also on the reach that that law will have, the form that law will have, um, so these are things that, that, that change according to, to the type of organization that the groups have. Uh, having said that, what I found in, the, in, in all the case studies is that 
armed groups, they, um, they are willing to adopt uh, some sort of uh, written or non-written source that would regulate their activities, specifically in the field of detention. And this is clear in the in the three case studies, but also in the discussions with other groups that they have adopted laws uh, or codes of conduct or internal decrees, uh, sometimes noting which category of individuals can be detained um, or whether they can be transferred or they cannot be transferred or how detainees should be treated. This is also included in agreements that Afghan groups have uh, concluded with other groups and with states, uh, some of this information at least. So. What I'm trying to say is uh, the, the case studies um, are reflective of the typology presented in chapter two, also how this whole issue of nexus uh, relates to, to non-state armed groups that is addressed in chapter uh, two, but also the issue of, of the adoption of laws and this pluralistic perspective that is examined in chapter three. Thank you. Um, we do only have an hour for this conversation, but I was given permission by Wes that we can run a little longer if we want to. So if anybody else has questions, please, uh, now is the time to put them in the chat. Um, we do have an excellent question from Joanna Sismas. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, that I'm just going to read and I would like Ezekiel to respond initially, but then if either Catherine or Natalie would like to add anything uh, in response to this question, that would be excellent. So Joanna asks that, um, Ezekiel, you noted that there are tensions between domestic law, i.e. non-state armed groups are unlawful entities under domestic law. And uh, so the tension between domestic law and human rights law that requires non-state armed groups to realize their obligations in respect to arbitrary detention. Do you also see tensions between general international law and uh, international human rights law? Would states, or for that matter, human humanitarians encouraging IHRL friendly law making by non-state armed groups violate the principle of non-interference with the domestic affairs of another state and or the sovereignty principle? And how can we solve for this issue? Who goes? Okay, I go. Uh, <laughs> no, this is a fascinating, a fascinating question. I think when when we deal, I mean, so just a general a general reflection is when we deal with non-state armed group uh, and armed groups, kind of everything uh, is is a place of tension. I would say because they are unlawful entities under domestic law. So already them being granted some sort of uh, recognition, which actually is reflected by the fact that they have international obligation. Uh, is, is already a, a place of tension because non-state armed groups, um, sometimes they're not even recognized as uh, parties to armed conflict. So not recognized as having international obligations um, and they're considered as terrorists, uh, which actually it might uh, create certain problems even for humanitarian actors trying to engage those groups as, um, as groups that have international obligations. So this is the first thing. And then, of course, the second part is the, the but again, uh, we can open this to, to Catherine and Natalie and you, Jess, as well, is that with respect to the lawmaking capacity is that this has not actually been explicitly recognized, although, um, I mean, there, there I would say two challenges with respect to international human rights. So the first one is you have to recognize that international human rights law creates binding obligations upon armed groups, which is not always recognized because these challenges the text of the treaties, but also uh, states as uh, the main sovereign in, in, in their own territories. Um, and the second one is that those obligations entail some sort of the obligation of non-state armed groups to adopt certain rules to be respectful of those obligations in the first place. I think it's clearer when dealing with international humanitarian law, uh, because this actually is being discussed nowadays in terms of administration of justice on what's the, the, the value of non-state armed groups laws um, in, in, with respect to international humanitarian law, and, and now, as I present, with respect to the prohibition of arbitrary deprivation of liberty in IHL. But this has not yet been so much developed uh, with respect to international human rights law. But I know that Catherine has worked on this also. Uh, and I mean, I'm happy if you and Natalie and, and Jess, you want to jump in. Um, well, I, I can say I, I can say a few words, but I, I, I mean, to be honest, I think a PhD could re be written on this topic. It's a classically impossible question, and I think that the sensible answer is to say it depends. Um, uh, and but no, I mean, as Ezekiel said, it, he's right to point out that there are always 
tensions in this area and, and you know Joanna mentions the the principle of non-interference but one could also mention counter-terrorism law which I think is another um, and probably the more um, uh, looming legal framework for humanitarian organizations thinking about what um, what action they can take um, in different circumstances. Um, and when I say it depends, I mean, I, I really do think it, it would depend. Um, I think it might depend on all kinds of things like um, like the factual context of the armed conflict and the circumstances in which the armed group is operating um, and has emerged. Um, and um, that would, you know, has it emerged out of a situation of grave breaches of violations by, by the territorial state? What is the territorial state present um, in that area or not? I think it would also classically have to depend on, on what the law, the purpose of the law in question was seeking to um, attach to. Um, you know, I've spoken to humanitarian organizations that have worked that have worked in in Syria in the earlier stages earlier stages of the conflict in the the um it, with the interim government of Syria and and the kind of staged um activities um setting out a comfort zone of assistance were were very staggered so were, whilst there were some NGOs that were willing to work with um, the Syrian interim government on um, registration of birth uh, certificates and that thereby working with um, the law um, and I think you know there in Joanna's question the the attention needs to be given to the word encouraging you know what what is the humanitarian organization doing um, so there were NGOs that were willing to work on issues like birth certificates because they were deemed to be the most humanitarian issues. But when it came to working with armed group courts, they drew a line and they drew that line for, for a number of reasons. Um, uh, reading between the lines, I think one of the reasons might have been um, also the consequence of a violation of a particular norm. I mean, if, if an armed group um, is operating courts and there's a violation of of the nor common article three relating to fair trial then that armed group has committed war crimes raising the question of course of sort of complicity issues um, to any entity that's been assisting the armed group um, um, running those courts so i think you know that there are it's a it's a, there are a ton of really difficult legal questions um, and interestingly, I mean, if people are interested in this, the um, it's called the, I have to um, get the English translation. It's called the AIV, the Advisory Committee on Public International Law, the Advisory Council on International Affairs was asked to provide an advisory report to the Dutch government on the provision and funding of non-lethal assistance to non-state armed groups abroad. Um, you can, I'll, I'll put the report in the chat because it's an interesting report. I think it's quite a cautious report. You have to remember they were advising the Dutch government, um, but it certainly covers um, explicitly the principle of non-interference. So it might be interesting. Thank you very much, Catherine. And yeah, I'm sure we would all love that link. Natalie, is there anything you would like to add in answer to that question? Um, at this stage, no, I, I think I've learned more than I can offer on this particular question. Um, thank you. Wonderful, thanks. Um, we have one more question in the chat from Josh and Neo, and I think it's really fascinating. So I'd love to hear uh, Ezekiel's response. Um, he asks whether you address detention by armed groups of their own members and what the legal framework looks like in such situations and how does that relate to issues around the capacity for armed groups to investigate and prosecute crimes internally? Thank you very much for, for this question, uh, Joshua. I think, um, so yes, uh, I, I, I do address detention by non-state armed groups of, of their own members. Um, so I should have said this before, but uh, when, when doing the case studies and addressing the, the behavior and the activities of non-state armed groups, I have identified that they detain individuals for different reasons and they detain different categories of individuals. Of course, they deprive their enemies, uh, which is, you know, so-called the uh, security detention, uh, these type of internments that uh, have been uh, named, uh, uh, such as they have been named internments. They also detain for criminal law reasons, and they detain for criminal law reasons individuals living in the territories they control, but also their own members for violations of international law, of international humanitarian law. Um, they detain their 
own members as well for um, disciplinary reasons that are not criminal in nature. So they do they undertake these two types of detention with respect to, own, the, to their own members, disciplinary detentions that are not necessarily criminal in nature and uh, criminal det detentions for issues that could be, for instance, violation of international humanitarian law, but also other, um, other uh, criminal law uh, violations. Um, let me reread the second part of the, uh, of the question. How does it relate to issues around the capacity of armed groups to investigate and prosecute crimes internally? This is also a very interesting and important question because in the last few years, there has been a, a lot of debate about the issue of command responsibility, about the obligation of inter armed groups to prevent, prosecute, and punish violations of international humanitarian law committed by their own members. In terms of capacity, it's, it's one of the, the important points because, again, the discussion has been uh, putting forward this, this obligation on the side of the armed groups, but also uh, the question about the capacity to undertake, for instance, trials that are respectful of um, fair trial guarantees, common article three, whether common article three applies to non-state armed groups own members. It's also another discussion. Um, so of course there is a, 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 a again, um, armed groups should uh, uh, respect minimum guarantees when they, um, deprive individuals of their liberty, be these individuals enemy forces, uh, civilians living in the territories that they control, but also their own forces. And they decide to prosecute any of these categories of individuals, they should also respect minimum uh, guarantees. And if they cannot do it, then they shouldn't be uh, prosecuting individuals. That's that's kind of my um, my standing on the on the topic. Of course, again, some of the things I think could be discussed and adapted. So of course, Let's face it, armed groups will not set up a tribunals every time they will want to prosecute one of their own members uh, for for certain uh, crimes. So it could it would be uh, a commander or it would be, uh, you know, th there are certain uh, issues that could still be uh, adapted. But I would still say that minimum guarantees would need still to be provided on the side of the groups. And if those guarantees cannot be provided uh, and individuals should have a, a right to defense uh, and, and so on, and they should be aware of why they're being prosecuted. Uh, so again, certain minimum guarantees need to be respected for those prosecutions to be respectful of, of minimum safeguards. Thank you, Ezekiel. Um, so before we wrap up, I really wanna give you an opportunity to sort of talk a little bit about the conclusions and recommendations that you make in the book. I don't think we've really touched on that yet. And you make this proposal for sort of a set of 10 recommendations of basic principles on detention by non-state armed groups that would really form sort of a minimum baseline or framework for um, non-state armed groups vis-a-vis -vis detention. So I just wanted to give you the opportunity to, to talk a little bit about that. And then to maybe just mention sort of how would that idea move forward? What are some of the strategies that the human humanitarian sector could use to engage non-state armed groups on uh, implementing those principles? Thank you. Thank you very much for this question, Jess. Uh, so this was actually, I mean, the, 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 the goal of this, um, this, conclude, this set of conclusions, this set of principles, as I put it, this 10 set of principles is, uh, first of all, it is not, uh, I'm not we I'm not creating a new set of a new legal framework. This is based on the obligations that armed groups have already um, and how they can be operationalized. I think there are two ways. One is, of course, uh, when humanitarian organizations or, or other stakeholders, they engage with non-state armed groups on issues related to detention. These set of principles could be used um, either by encouraging armed groups to follow some of these principles or to integrate those principles to their own internal rules or, or codes of conduct. So this is on the side of humanitarian actors. On the side of the armed groups or humanitarian actors or other stakeholders, because there are numerous stakeholders that engage with non-state armed groups that are not necessarily humanitarian in nature. And then you also have non-state armed groups themselves. I mean, they could uh, adopt and follow some of these uh, principles in their detention activities. Um, what I like to highlight uh, for, of these principles that are based on, on international law is that they, many of these rules, they are conscious of the capacity, of the factual capacity of the groups to apply the rules of international law. And this is why in various parts of the principles, it is explicitly said that this is to the maximum uh, extent feasible. You know, it, they should be respected to the maximum extent feasible because sometimes armed groups uh, do not have the capacity to apply 
all the set of the international obligations. And this is one of the problems that compliance uh, of international law um, faces. So these principles are conscious of that challenge. And this is why some minimum standards, they, they should be applied every time, but others, they could be applied to the maximum extent feasible on, on the side of the groups. Um, again, it is a way to operationalize some of the conclusions of the book that in which you know they, they found that uh, non-state armed groups rely on their own on their own sources to deprive individuals of the liberty. The different categories that I mentioned before: cases of internment, enemy fighters, cases of uh, criminal law detentions happening in the territories they control, uh, or their own members for criminal law uh, cases or, or even disciplinary measures. So the way in which these principles had, were conceived was to operationalize these findings and to put something in concrete. Um, having worked for humanitarian organizations that, that engage with armed groups and specifically at Geneva, although I speak in my personal capacity, um, I, I see the relevance of directly engaging with armed, armed groups on humanitarian issues and also on specific uh, tools of engagement that can be used for that purpose, such as, you know, minimum principles, Geneva calls the deeds of commitment or other uh, uh, tools uh, toward that direction. Thank you very much. Um, this was a wonderful discussion. So thank you to Natalie and to Catherine for those really rich and thoughtful remarks on Ezekiel's work. And Ezekiel, congratulations on this project. It's really tremendous and you bring together so many different strands in a way that is very clear and persuasive. And like I said at the beginning, I'm really excited to now has, have this as a resource for teaching my students in the future. And thank you to all of our attendees for joining for this discussion. Joanna said in the chat that she could listen to Ezekiel and Catherine all day, and I totally agree. We could have kept this conversation going a lot longer, um, but we have to draw it to a close because it's evening for Catherine, and I'm sure other people have other places to be. Um, so thank you to everybody, and thank you to ASIL and the Leaves Society for uh, arranging this event today.